Make it simple. 2 Kings chapter 6, and we'll be going through 6 and 7. 2 Kings chapter 6, it's after 1 Kings. Okay, it's in the Old Testament. That's the only advice I'm going to give you. Understand this. Today, Miss Peggy, I'm going to do some exegeting preaching. It's a little bit different. In other words, we're going to just walk through some stuff here and help you understand that it looks like history is repeating itself. When I look through the Bible, I see history starting to repeat itself. Have you ever seen either on television, real life situation where some guy threw himself to the wind, rushed into a dangerous situation and came out a hero? Or else someone who took a huge financial risk and came out a multimillionaire uh, over the last two days, a man was in Vegas and hit the slots and uh, became a millionaire overnight. That'll never be you. I know you think it is, but no, the chances are way too, too crazy. But it happens. When, when they've been interviewed, maybe you heard them say, well, I'm not brave. I was desperate. That was my best friend in a burning house, so of course I ran in to get him. Or maybe you heard the, the now fabulously rich men say, I may be fortunate, but hardly courageous. Frankly, I was at a point where I had nothing to lose. This morning, I want to teach a message to you, preach a message, nothing to lose. Everybody say nothing to lose. There's something about having nothing to lose. When I got born again, the truth is I had nothing to lose. I was a young man who had uh, issues with alcohol and drugs. Uh, I, I had no direct, this to be honest with you, the alcohol and drugs, I, I could deal with that. The no direction I couldn't deal with. I had no direction. I had no purpose. I had no reason for actually getting up in the morning. So that was where I struggled. And so when I met Jesus, I had nothing to lose. And so I just gave my life to him, and everything shifted and changed. Everything was great. And when you look in the book of Kings, we realize that a famine in Israel, you know, it was more of a result, not of the... Uh, the fact that another nation wanted to take over Israel, but it was a fact that at that time the kings were full of witchcraft and idolatry. They were serving the God of Baal, B-A-E-L. You can study about him. Every wickedness you see today still comes from that foreign god Baal. It's, it's amazing, again, how you can relate that. And the scenario takes place during the period of Israel's divided monarchy. I think there's a picture right here. If you'll look with me just real fast, this is the picture of Israel, all right? And when you look at Israel here, you see that Israel's to the north at this time. It was a divided nation. You had Judah to the south. Judah, the, the uh, capital was Jerusalem. And the capital of Israel was a town called Samaria. You read a lot about Jesus. I must go through Samaria. I also want you to notice this little place here called Philistia, which is where the Philistines were in the Old Testament, which is also known today as Gaza. And that's where the Philistines still are. That's why this attack keeps going on. It's not changed. It's always been this way. So what we find in this time is Samaria is under siege. There is a group from Aram that's come down to siege him. Ben-Hadab is the, the king there. And by the way, Aram is uh, Lebanon that's attacking Israel. Are you hearing me? It's still going on today. Lebanon is still attacking Israel. Gaza is still attacking Israel. It hasn't changed. This fight's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. Now we get to 2 Kings chapter 6, and we realize that sometime later, Benadab, king of Aram, which is, by the way, I said uh, Lebanon, which is Syria. It's actually Syria. So both nations were attacking. Mobilized his entire army and marched up and, uh, and laid siege to Samaria. There was a great famine in the land. To siege something means to surround it and not let anything in or out. So when they seized it, there was no water getting in unless they already had water, no food getting in. And so what they're doing is they're squeezing them in such a place that they've got to give in, they've got to give up. The siege took place for so long that there was a great famine there. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver. That's $350 for a donkey's head. Now, I know that you can get some cheap meat off that, but that's some cheap meat as far as I'm concerned, but $350. And then it says, and two cups of dove's dung. Don't let me interpret that. <laughs> dove's dung was selling for about 20 bucks, And that was just enough to probably make some dove's dung soup. 
As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried, king of Israel. So he's, he's there in Israel, the northern part, in Samaria that's being seized. There was a woman that yelled, help me, my, my lord, the king. The king replied, if the Lord does not help you, where can I get help for you? For, from the threshing floor? Is the floor going to help you? Is the wine press going to help you? Then he asked her, what's the matter? She answered, this woman said to me, give up your son so we may eat him today. See, you don't understand how violent sometimes the Old Testament can be and how sad. She said, give up your son, we'll eat him today. So he cooked my son and ate him. I mean, I, I'm reading this, I'm thinking, this, this is heartbreaking. And then, and then she said, uh, so we did that. And the next day I said to her, give up your son so we may eat him. But she hid him. Of course she did. She's full. When the king heard the woman's words, he tore his robes as he went along the wall. The people looked and said, and saw that under his robes he had sackcloth on his, bo on his body, which is a way of mourning. He said, may God, and by the way, when he said God, he's not talking about Jehovah. He's talking about Baal, his God. May God deal with me be it ever so severely, if the head of Elisha, son of Shepheth, remains on his shoulders today. So let me tell you who I'm blaming this on. I'm blaming it on the preacher. It's the preacher's fault we ain't had rain. It's the preacher's fault we ain't had food. It's the preacher's fault that we in this mess. The preacher said this. The preacher said, oh, he's upset. Oh, he's mad. Isn't it funny how we blame employers or leaders or others whenever we get in a mess? So are they in a mess? By the way, whose fault was it? It was the king's fault for serving other gods. Amen. All these kings, he's a part of a, a, a series of kings that serve wicked gods. And God's trying to get his people to act right, turn around, do the right thing. Now, Elisha, the prophet, was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him, his entourage. The king sent a messenger ahead, said, but before he arrived, Elisha said to the elders, don't you see how this murderer is sending someone to cut off my head? Elisha already knew. God done told him that they fit to kill you. They come to kill you. And he said, look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold it shut against him. Is not the sound of his master's footsteps behind him? When I read that, I thought, dear God, give me enough people that can hold the door for me. Uh -huh. Give me enough people that can shut the door and hold it for me because his master's right behind him. So you've got a man coming to knock on the door, and then you've got the king coming in behind him. And the king said, this disaster's from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? And Elisha replied, chapter 7, verse 1, hear the word of the Lord. I love this. He's yelling through the door. You hear me? He ain't opened the door and looked out. He yelled through the door. He said, hey, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a, a bushel of the finest flour will sell for a shekel. And two bushels of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. What are you talking about? You mean this time? We're, in a, we're, we're selling donkey's heads for $350. We're selling dove dungs for a $20 bill. $20 is $20. Hey, man, we got all this going on, and now you telling me that tomorrow everything, gasoline going to be back down to a buck 25? You telling me tomorrow I'm going to be able to buy a Dodge for, for $20,000? Hey, man, are you kidding me? You're telling me this time tomorrow everything going to be all right? You're crazy. Then the officer of whom the arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? You'll see it with your own eyes, answered Elisha, but you ain't going to get to eat any of it. Woo. In other words, you doubting the word of the Lord. You're doubting what God says is going to happen. So because you're a doubter and not a believer, you ain't going to get to eat any of it. Nothing to lose. Everybody say nothing to lose. <laughs> now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the gate, the outside the gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there, and we'll die. And if we stay here, we're going to die. So let's go over. See, you see where their dilemma was? They got, they got leprosy. They can't go into the city. 
Because if they go in there, they, everybody dying in there, and they sure ain't going to feed them the scraps. Because normally the scraps came over the wall. That's where they were. But after, you know, six, seven, eight, ten days, ain't no scraps coming over the wall. Everybody eating all the scraps. So what are they going to do? And then they say, well, the Arameans are out there. They got us surrounded. Well, if we stay here, we're going to die. So let's, we go out there. If they kill us, we're going to die. Either way, we're going to die. So let's do something. In other words, we ain't got nothing to lose. I'm going to tell you this. In your life, you ain't got nothing to lose. Whenever you decide, I'm going to turn my life over to Jesus. Because I'm going to, if I stay the way I am now, I'm going to die of my sins. I'm going to get messed up. I might as well turn everything over to him. Can I get an amen? amen. So the scripture says, at dusk, they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear a sound of the chariots and horses and a great army. So that they had, they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and the Egyptian, remember the Egyptians from the south, Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and their donkeys and left the camp as it was and they ran for their lives. These four lepers are sitting outside this gate and suddenly it dawns on them. We ain't got nothing to lose. We might as well go on out there and see what's going to happen. It amazes me how much clarity you can have when you're out of options. You ain't got no options. Right. Amen. We talk about counting the cost. Well, when you go to count and there ain't nothing there, there ain't even nothing to count here. So you, you'll know you're free to make a decision. So when you come to your wit's end, that's a really nice place where God wants to meet you. These four lepers threw caution to the wind, and finally they took the only logical course, amen, left. Boy, were they surprised when they got there. I wonder how big the panic was. And we'll talk a little bit more about the panic in a minute. But notice, there were thunderous, give, give me back here, give me back here, Bobby. There were thunderous sounds as they walked. See, in my mind's eye, I think God amplified their feet. I think as they walked, four of them walking. And as they were walking, it was the sound of thunder, and, and then our Arameans heard it. And when they heard it, they thought they were fixing to be attacked, and it looks like it was probably around, not around supper time, amen, somewhere around in there. Now, remember, Israel was, at that time, completely undeserving of a miracle. They don't deserve a miracle. Just like we didn't deserve salvation. They didn't deserve it, man. But God did it because he's a good God. God. So they delighted in their refreshments, in their riches, in their raiment. They had hit the jackpot. The end of the rainbow landed right there in the Aramean camp. When they got there, the scripture says the men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp, entered one of the tents, and they ate and they drank. Oh, man, this had to be good. Then they took silver and gold and clothes, and, and they went off, and they hid them, and they returned, and they entered another tent, and they took some more things from it, and they hid them also. You can imagine, amen, having the opportunity to find gold and silver, amen, and, and nice clothes and stuff, and, and you go out, and you, and you put them clothes on, and, and say, boy, I look good in this. Yeah, I'm not talking about the thieves that break into, 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 into stores and steal it. I'm talking about somebody went out and ain't nobody there food still on the table they find clothes they gather up all, 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 all the money they can find and they begin to hide it oh this is a great day amen they excited four lepers just became the richest people in all of Israel right. wealthy <sighs> their initial acting was on impulse it's just human nature isn't it to hide it to, to put it up to say, you know, I got, God has blessed me with this. God did this. God blessed me with this. Amen. It, but their conscience got stricken down inside here. Because you know what these four lepers had? They had family inside that city. These four lepers had, they may have had children inside that city. They might have had husbands or, wi or excuse me, wives inside that city. They may have had people inside that city they loved. And it, all of a sudden it hit them. They were in a dilemma of their realization and their reason and resolve when they had said to each other, what we're doing is not right. Well, I think it's pretty right. They just kicked you out of the city because you got leprosy. You didn't ask for leprosy. Amen. And after that, you didn't get no food. And you don't want it made the move to go there and cause the Arameans to run off. Amen. I think it's a pretty right thing to do. But in their heart, they felt like, this, this, ain't, this ain't right what we're doing. This is the day of good news. Everybody say good news. Good news. What is the gospel? Good news. Say it again. Good news. 
The gospel is good news, man. It's good news to share. This is a day of good news, and we're keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this back to the royal palace. So they went and they called out to the city gatekeepers and told them, we went into the Aramean camp and no one was there. Not, not a sound of anyone, only tethered horses and donkeys and the tents left just as they were. Now remember, the lepers had to call the watchman outside the gate. They couldn't go in. But here's the scene. When those lepers showed back up, That's right. Come on. they were dressed in Armani, <laughs> wearing Bostonian shoes and the latest in 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 Ariat britches. <laughs> they're eating big old turkey leg. <laughs> and they yell at the guy up in the gate. And they say, hey, we went into the Armenian camp. Nobody was there. No one was there. They left everything for us. And that they're yelling up there. And now they got now inside they got a dilemma. Because at that moment, they have to go and investigate. I call it Leprogate. <laughs> One of the officials answered, have some men take five of the horses that are left in the city. Their plot would be like that of all the Israelites left here. Yes, they will only be like all the Israelites who are doomed. So let us send them to find out what happened. So they selected two chariots and their horses, and the king sent them after the Armenian army. He commanded the drivers, go and find out what has happened. Now, I want you to pay attention to how the scripture read it. Go get five of the horses that are left. Which means what? They done ate all the rest of the horses. They, I mean, this is sad. And, but here, if I was to look down and look at them lepers, all, they got little nubs, but on their nubs, they got diamond rings on it. Hey, man, they got gold chains hanging, looking like Deion Sanders come walking up out there. Hey, man, looking all good and stuff. And they say, well, we, we, we can't do anything with these guys. What are they doing? I, surely this is a setup. See, that's what the king thought. He thought it was, a, it was a setup going on. Then we got this holy littering happening. And in verse 15 says, they followed them as far as Jordan, and they found the whole road strong with clothing and equipment. Their man's had thrown away in their headlong flight, so the messengers returned and reported to the king. Man, they, there's clothes, there's stuff laid all over the place out there. I mean, they, they've stripped and ran. These guys panicked so badly that they not only fled on foot, they could have ridden their horses. They left their horses there. Amen. Literally tore off their armor and their weapons, and they fled for their lives. Now, I don't know how much time elapsed between their leaving to, uh, to do the leper gate and, and their returning and confirming to the leper's report, but there was precious time wasted. But I'm going to tell you this. Those guys that rode out on them horses, I bet they ate good before they came back. <laughs> Huh? I bet they ate good. I bet they found them some gold and they got them some clothes and they came back. Now, verse 17. Now, the king had put the officer on whose arm he leaned in charge of the gate. Oh, hold on. I missed one. Prophecy fulfilled this time tomorrow. Remember what Elisha said? This time tomorrow. So it's nighttime. They can't wait till the morning. All this is taking place. Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans so that a bushel of the finest flour sold for a shekel and two bushels of barley sold for a shekel, as the Lord had said. In other words, they found so much flour they found so much barley. They found so much. Because a siege to take place means that that, uh, that Armenian camp had to be full of food. Because they had to feed their army while all of this here was being seized. So they had everything. Israel was saved. They were spared. The prophecy of Elisha was fulfilled to the very word. And the beauty of it was that they didn't have to lift a finger to see it happen. God did it for them because four lepers. I can't help my mind. I always see them as Hoss, Little Joe, Adam, and Scrappy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They had to be one of them named Scrappy. Had to be because that's all he ate was scraps. And now he's getting, he's looking fine and good. Verse 17, stay and die, go and live. Now the king had put the officer on whose arm, remember the guy? It said it ain't going to happen. He leaned in charge of the gate, and the people trampled him in the gateway 
and he died. He stood there in the crowd and held his hands up and said, hey, 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 whoa, slow down. And they ran over him. They were so hungry, they wanted to get out to the camp. Just as the man of God had foretold, when the king came down to his house, it happened as the man of God had said to the king, about this time tomorrow, a bushel of the finest flour will sell, a bushel of barley will sell. Verse 19, the officer had said to the man of God, look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of heaven, could this happen? The man of God replied, you will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat any of it. And that is exactly what happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gateway, and he died. Imagine as I close. Imagine you're the guy they appoint to be charged with crowd control in the aftermath of a famine. And now suddenly there's food. And you say, thanks, I'll pass. Because I'm so stubborn. Because I said it wasn't going to happen. And there are people out there that st still today say, well, Jesus ain't coming back. Jesus ain't going to help you. Jesus can't save you. And they're standing like they're outside the door of Noah's ark as the rains are coming down with no belief in their heart. When the lepers discovered that the camp of the Syrians was empty, they ate and they drank and they carried away the silver and gold and hid it for themselves. And at some point, they said to one another, we ain't doing right. Here's what I loved. All four were in agreement. All four. They went to them and said, no, I ain't doing it. I hate that bunch in there. And the other two said, I'm going back. No, all four said, this is a day of good news. They were in unity, and they went back, had to be dressed to the, to the nines, amen, looking good, swagging, amen. They said, we too know that there is a good news that transforms lives. I know that. You know that. And it, he listened. That God can take the broken and bring healing. He can bring hope. He can, he can help people. But many times we outside the gate, and we've already been and seen the good news, but we don't share it with other people. We don't bring it back to them. There are two kinds of people I've noticed. There are those who know they are sick, who know they need a physician. They know it. They've been told. They've seen the x-rays. They know they need help. And then there are those who don't know they're sick, and don't want to hear it. There are those who know there's a sickness within their soul and they need Jesus. And then there are those that refuse God. And they have a stubbornness, the Bible says, of heart. Matter of fact, it's, it's a callousness of the heart. That's why the scripture talks about plowing up the heart. To be tender of heart. To be able to hurt with people hurt. To be able to rejoice with people that rejoice. To feel for people. Amen. When the Jewish leaders saw that Jesus was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they questioned him and his disciples. And they asked the question, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? Why is he hanging out with prostitutes? Do you know what the answer Jesus had in Mark 2, 17? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. If you know you're sick, you need Jesus. If you know that you need help, you need Jesus. Revelation 3, 17 says, Because you say, I'm rich, I have need of nothing, and you do not know what you are, that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Hold that right there. I want, to, I want you to catch this. I had a discussion with a man this week, and we talked about a, a former friend of mine from years ago who is now a millionaire. When I met him, he was not a millionaire. He was a man who was growing in business and stuff. But now that he is wealthy, he's miserable. He's lost his best friends. He's allowed the finances to cause his, his empire to grow as far as what he has on earth. But he's getting older. And one day he's going to pass from this earth without anything other than what he leaves behind. Not helping, not blessing, not caring. And, and I told the gentleman I was talking with, I've never wanted to be rich. I've just wanted to be favored. I just want to be blessed of God because I know what it takes when you're wealthy. 
It's hard on you to turn things back toward God. Everybody's demanding of you. Everybody's trying to take from you. I, I got to give it to Hoss, little Joe, Ben, and Scrappy. Because they could have kept all that for themselves. But it was a day of good news. And what Jesus did for me and you is a day of good news. Amen. It turned to, and he says here, what you need is to get some eye salve to anoint your eyes so you may see. Because evidently you're blind. You're rich, but you're blind. You're miserable and rich. You're poor, blind, you're naked, and you're rich. See, you don't even realize you need me. And that's what God did to them at that moment. He forced them to realize, I got you. Can you imagine at that moment the elevation of Elisha the prophet? As the people began to understand it was the word of the Lord out of his mouth that caused this to happen. Now everybody begins to turn back toward God. So I ask this question as I close. Is anything too difficult for God? Oh, man. When the king heard the good news, he wouldn't believe it. He thought it was a trick. Unbelief will keep you from enjoying the promises of God. And how many people don't take God at his word and therefore don't have the promise that God has given them? Jeremiah 32, 17. Oh, Lord God. I like the way Jeremiah starts. Ah, oh, Lord God. Behold, you've made the heavens and earth by your great power, by your outstretched arm. The scripture says, He scattered the stars with His hand. Why are they? And they stuck. That's right. I was in the hospital as a young boy, and I remember I was so bored. I got a straw and some paper. <laughs> Before I left that hospital room as a teenager, I had spit wad stuck all over that ceiling. It took me, it took me hours to get that part of my bed to stick. Happy birthday, sis. All over the ceiling. God just went, whew. heavens and earth scattered the stars. Nothing is too difficult for him. Jeremiah 32, 27, behold, I'm the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? It was a question, and you have to answer it. You have to answer it. Is there anything too difficult, too hard for him? The answer is no. I say the answer is no. Listen, when you're raising kids, grandkids, or you're a guardian, when life throws difficult things in your life, you got to turn to a God that says, there ain't nothing too difficult for me. There's nothing too difficult. Just because we can't imagine how God might answer it. How can he turn it around in a day? How can he flip this situation? It's taken us months, years to get into this mess. How can God flip it in one day? We can't imagine it. No, you can't. You're a crawl dad sitting on a railroad track looking at a train coming, trying to figure out what is that coming toward me. You can't figure it out. Get off the tracks. Amen? I can't figure out how God's going to do it. But he can do it. Heads bowed, eyes closed. The book of James said, we have not because we ask not. You're in a difficult situation right now. Yeah, you may have came up for prayer, but I'm going to ask you one more time. I want you to say to God what that situation is. And I want you to hand it to him. And then I want you to give God permission to handle it any way he wants to. God, we give you this situation, this difficulty. We need wisdom as we walk through it. Lord God, I thank you that every tear has been bottled, every concern has been heard. God, if your answer to this situation is no, we understand, but if it's yes, any way you want to do it, take care of it. Oh, Lord God, there's nothing too difficult for you. We stand amazed and in awe of all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
someday you may look at a message like this and say, well, it didn't really apply to me now. But then one day it will. And you're going to realize, you know what, i got to go back and read that scripture about Scrappy. i got to see how them lepers, first off, and let me just say this to you. Their leprosy was not healed. <laughs> their leprosy was not healed. They probably still died soon after. But they blessed a whole city, a whole nation in what they did. Sometimes maybe I don't get healed, but maybe I'm able to bless somebody else. Amen. Our servant leaders come up real quick. If you need to tie the offering envelope, it's in front of you. If you're giving online, you go to holywild.net slash give. Holywild.net slash give. I've observed the weather. I see what's going to happen Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Rain's in the forecast. Temperature's going to drop 20 degrees between this time and the next week. We've made such preparations, and yet, hmm, I know about gearheads and hot rods and bikers. They don't show up if the weather's bad. And this ain't about reaching y'all. Y'all already been got. Amen? Amen? We all been got. We after folk that ain't in church. We after unchurched believers, folk that ain't in church, folk that don't even know Jesus. Amen. So we'll, we'll have some good times, and we'll, we'll make some plans for some family days and things of that nature and get-togethers throughout December to happen with most of our our. Uh, classes and groups but we're going to have to postpone next Sunday we're going to move it to a warmer day here's another thing Frank I preached under that tabernacle and it was 60 something degrees one time and nobody stayed under the tabernacle everybody stood out in the sun I might as well preach over yonder no here and nobody wanted to sit right here it was cold and it's just human nature so until we get that right day and we see it coming up, we've already made preparations. Many of you have already made plans. So I've already talked with some. See, there's a phone call there about it. <laughs> and we'll get the word out. I hate it. I hate not doing it. I've always loved it. But I don't want to just do something just for the sake to be doing it. If it's not going to reach the people we want to reach. Amen? Amen. So, with that being said, you start reaching people. You start realizing the good news. You go into the enemy's camp and watch what God does for you. You start bringing guests into this house. Not only that, take them on bike rides, take them out to eat, invite them over to your house for supper sometime. you got neighbors all around you need God. Amen? He's coming. He's coming soon. First he said, I'm going to, I'm going to come, and he did. Then he said, I'm going to die. And he did. Then he said, I'm going to rise again. And he did. Then he said, I'm going to come back. Well, if he's done down these three, right, right, right. I'm pretty sure he's going to do this one. So prepare yourself for this one. Amen. Amen. As we give today, we believe in God for more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. 